Hi folks, Paul Roberts here with our next video fishing journal, uh, number 33 now. My video fishing journals, if you're new to them, uh, generally have themes that address interesting challenges, uh, puzzles that fishing tends to dish out. It's our opportunity to hit the water together and put into practice the type of info that the nature of fishing focuses on. Uh, the story of fishing from the fish side of the fence. The attempt at least to get at the whys that underlie the what's, where's, when's, and how's of fishing. One fundamental theme running through all my video fishing journals is seasonality. And in this one we're sliding into fall. Fall fishing once again. Uh, since fall comes around again and again every year, it would be worth uh, worthwhile to see our previous fall video fishing journals. Um, in this case, it's uh, journals 25 to 28 in particular for some background on the summer to fall transition. Um, info that, that will play a role in this video too. As a heads up, I consider our video fishing journals as an archive that can be revisited again and again since that info uh, that's presented in each remains relevant year in, year out. Another theme that I touch on are the habitat options that each water body we visit offers the bass and their prey. Uh, this is akin to, or my take on, what's known in the bass fishing world as pattern fishing. The questions being, where, when, on what, and how makes up a good bite? Uh, what we can put together to make a successful fishing day. What makes bass special in this regard is that they are truly multi-role, nearly master of all trades predators. Uh, bass are eclectic feeders, capable of making use of nearly all, all the prey types in a given body of water, uh, in, on, or above the water surface for that matter. It's true that, at times, bass may specialize to a degree on certain abundant prey types. Uh, bluegills, shad, and crayfish are probably the, the big three for largemouths uh, here in the U.S. Uh, but bass are great samplers okay, of all that swims, paddles, slithers, or crawls. So part of my game, the, the way I approach a body of water, is to try and ID what prey options exist there. Now, you don't have to do this. <laughs> uh, you can also just take advantage of the bass's eclectic nature by throwing lures uh, appropriate to the conditions and circumstances in front of you. Uh, this is the way most anglers go at it uh, and, and how fishing patterns can often be sifted out. However, uh, I like to go a bit deeper if I can and I can't help it at this point in the game, having developed the background to recognize different prey habitats as well as that bassy habitat. And I find great satisfaction when the two uh, come together. Now I'm not talking about a full-blown match the hatch approach, since what passes for a prey item to fish can be surprisingly broad, uh, even when those fish are specializing on something particular. I recognize that the conditions and circumstances that we and the fish face weigh in heavy in terms of our best tackle choices. But I've come to recognize that knowing what the fish are feeding on can help, sometimes a lot, in our ability to home in on where in particular, when and how on a given water body. Of course, recognizing habitat options is but one part of the puzzle. We still have to catch them. And that's the final fundamental theme for my video fishing journals. Uh, trying to discern, home in on uh, good techniques, lure choices, and presentations to take advantage of what's going on on, that, on a given fishing day. Our water body for this journal is a 12 acre heavily vegetated pond. This one, like the last one we fished in Journal 32, was flood impacted uh, in 2013, uh, seven years ago now, but apparently less so. And unlike our last pond, this one has developed quite the opposite bass size population structure. Uh, I, I was actually pleased to find a bulge in that, that size structure. <laughs> Smack in the quality size bracket, those 15 to 16 inch, roughly two pound fish. 
So the upper graph here shows that our Journal 32 pond, um, over five days of fishing, gave up no bass in that quality size bracket. Uh, that two pound roughly uh, size bracket, but five over four pounds. The lower graph shows our current Journal 33 pond uh, over two half days of fishing. And it gave up no bass over three pounds, <laughs> but 16 in that quality size bracket, not counting three, uh, three quality fish that I lost before I could uh, get a really good look at them. I've not inquired, but I suspect that this pond does not receive the supplemental stocking that uh, our Journal 32 pond regularly does, instead relying on natural repro reproduction, um, at this point anyway, post-flood. Pre-flood, the pond had a good population of smallmouth bass, uh, some reaching 20 inches. Post-flood now, the smallies appear to be gone, sadly. <laughs> In such densely weeded water, largemouths tend to outcompete smallmouths. Uh, but pre-flood, the smallies were able to dominate the more open water areas that existed then, uh, smallies being a more mobile and faster species. The largemouths occupied the shallower, cover-strewn shoreline areas and, and the away-from-shore weed beds. Uh, those smallies fed along the shoreline shelves too though, um, and, and even appeared hunting bluegills under the mats of filamentous algae slop that formed every summer, like you'd expect largemouths. Uh, it was pretty cool having little smallmouths and big ones blow up on hollow-bodied frog lures uh, from under those surface mats. As far as prey species, there was and still is a large crayfish population, um, as well as bluegills and gizzard shad. Uh, yellow perch are, are here too. Post flood, red ear sunfish appear to have been stocked. Uh, both the red ears and bluegills then grew large post flood, uh, which, which piqued my interest in, 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 this, in this pond, uh, making it one to watch. Possibly some bass will be able to grow large enough to start preying on those, those uh, oversized sunfishes, uh, maybe offering some semblance of trophy potential for this water. That's a big if, however, as a developmental strategy for sunfishes is to grow large to defeat such predation. Uh, but this is a scenario worth keeping track of, as not all waters can even produce prey fishes large enough to feed outsized bass. Remembering this pond pre-flood, uh, uh, the pond had good water clarity and a relatively open basin, averaging 12 feet deep. And this appears to have remained the same uh, post-flood. Topographically, shorelines are fairly steep at, at the bank edge, with a narrow uh, three-foot deep shelf along the shore that then slopes into a roughly 20-foot wide shoreline shelf that's six to seven feet in depth at the shelf edge whereupon it drops into the 11 to 13 foot basin. The main basin of our pond is the largest, deepest, and most voluminous. Uh, Pre-flood, the deepest areas of the main basin uh, were mostly open uh, and carpeted with low-lying cara, uh, indicating a firm, sandy, uh, gritty substrate. It's now, post-flood, mostly carpeted in coontail, which uh, d does die back some uh, with light loss in the fall opening some areas up. Uh, there are a few uh, smallish areas that are uh, virtually totally clean on the bottom, uh, apparently where um, entering and exiting floodwaters scoured and deposited uh, uh, inorganic, inorganic sediments, uh, stuff that, that uh, plants are having a hard time grow on, growing on. Uh, but possibly as water clarity increases, uh, Kara might reestablish. The basin is and always has been uh, rimmed with both coontail and milfoil along the shorelines um, out to about six feet of water with coontail predominating deeper. Presently, there appears to be enough clarity and light penetration that, that coontail is well established throughout the basin. Uh, milfoil appears relegated to the shallower areas, uh, that light loving milfoil. The most notable change post flood was additional fertility that poured in, causing a burgeoning of aquatic vegetation, namely coontail, that carpeted the entire pond to within a few feet of the surface. 
Upon seeing this, I decided to give this pond a few years to hopefully diversify its vegetation, uh, break up that, that solid wall of, of coontail. A solid wall-to-wall -wall mass of coontail is darn tough to fish. And the bass I caught there during uh, an early spring exploratory outing showed poor body condition, uh, being thin for that, that time of year. Spring fish are usually just about maximal in weight. Man, that is a thin, it's a longer fish. Gosh, they're thin. There's something of a south basin too that is shallower and a bit more stagnant, uh, being somewhat more wind protected from the main basin. It also holds a, a fair amount of milfoil, which bass love. Again, this pond has a good population of quality size largemouths in the, the 15 to 16 inch range. Um, they were on the thin side on this outing, uh, which is to be expected in late summer and into early fall um, in, in many waters. Uh, they showed evidence of feeding well though, now that fall has struck, quite literally, uh, brought on uh, by an early heavy snowfall. So much heat was sucked out of the pond during that frigid front that summer conditions will not likely return. Uh, fall's probably here to stay. Uh, and the fall feeding binge is likely on. This early frigid spell should also set up some opportunities for reheating of the shallows, which in turn should bring periods of increased aggression in our bass. Um, and some concentrated carnage zones are something to watch for. I put in two days on the water, uh, one on either side of that unseasonably cold front that dumped as much as 10 inches of snow. Uh, not the usual thing for September here. Pre-front, the air temps were well into the 90s for highs, uh, up until literally the day before that snow fell, uh, resulting in a 60 degree Fahrenheit drop in air temperature in 24 hours. Day one. Just before the snow, I called a typical early fall outing with vegetation dying back and water temps in the high 60s to mid 70s. Day two, after the front, um, uh, was still early fall, uh, but, but a bit, the water temperature was a bit cooler. Uh, and with some evidence of the fall feeding binge firing up. So the question is, where are the biters most likely to be? Uh, deep or shallow? Uh, that is, in a pond like this, uh, a shoreline or away from shore. The depths, the deeper spots, are likely to be used by some bass, especially with gizzard shad and yellow perch present. Uh, but I'll be focusing mostly shallow, that is the upper water column, as that's where the heating is this time of year. Also, this being during the early fall vegetation die-off, it's possible that the bottom of the deeper areas, uh, called the benthos, uh, may be oxygen deprived uh, due to uh, decomposition of, of that dead plant matter collecting down there. Uh, a camera sent down there uh, suggested that this might indeed be the case. Uh, it was pretty funky looking down there. And I started noticing yellow perch um, up in the shallows near the shorelines, uh, suggesting they may not be using their usual uh, deeper benthic areas. <sighs> okay, <laughs> that's the background, uh, what we're gonna see. So let's hit the water and insert ourselves into some early fall uh, bass behavior patterns. Okay, day one conditions. Uh, it's early fall, uh, uh, prior to the snow front. Uh, water temps show a, a 67 degree Fahrenheit core um, and, and isothermic in the morning. Um, that is the whole water column at the same temperature. Uh, with surface temperatures uh, then reaching 74 degrees Fahrenheit uh, over the course of the day. Uh, water clarity offered about, th uh, looked like about three feet of visibility. I arrived, um, having not seen the pond in, in a number of years, with 
heavy veggie tackle. <laughs> but soon wished I'd brought some finesse gear along um, after seeing the, the, the good water clarity and that the vegetation had begun to die back quite a bit. Such is being out of touch with a water body. Uh, I started by walking about 80 yards of shoreline, uh, something I almost, almost always do. Uh, I, I, it's like poor man's side scanning, <laughs> okay? Uh, and I spotted very few bluegills and only one mature bass. Uh, not, not promising for shoreline pounding. Uh, and my shoreline, uh, uh, fishing that shoreline cover turned out to be nearly uneventful. Uh, I then switched to away from shore areas and immediately began picking up fish. I did some away from shore sonar mapping, uh, hoping for a good weed transition, uh, and covered some surface blipping shad schools as I went. Um, I, I took some fish from away from shore uh, milfoil clumps, dead, dead milfoil clumps that had a lot of strands floating. Um, it was almost slop like. All right. Not all that spectacular looking, except that I've got overhead trees. No shade, but an overhead tree and some weed clumps in front of me. And there's one on cattails with overhead trees and some weed clumps. Let her go. Oh well. Nice. That was somebody goblin. That was small bass. There's one. That's fish number two in there. Little guy. That's actually fish number three, strike number three. First one was about a pound and a three quarter. This is a little dude. But you're not in bad con body condition. Oh, he weighed a crayfish, I believe. That looks like, maybe, yeah, there's a crayfish antenna in there. I'm gonna let you keep it, since I know. All right, that's interesting. We might be back to Kara here, do you think? Do you think? There's a fish. Oh! That was a good fish and I lost him. Let's drop. get him. So what I'm wondering, I guess I'd better check my hook point.
There's one. Whoa. Oh, that's two in a row there. And good ones, too. Okay, I gotta sharpen this hook, I think. Or the rod is softer than I thought. Well, you took it deep. All right. Oh, soak my camera. I'm gonna do it again, huh? Oh. Sure enough. Clean that camera. Mm-hmm. Wow. Wow. Not dangerous, but deep. Okay. 16 plus and on the thin side. Two strikes right there. belly and there's nothing in there. All right, sweetie. Let's see if there's a gizzard shed in your stomach. Did you just eat somebody? Finding anything. There you go. Nope. Zippo, you must have missed, huh? You must have missed, huh? one and it's a good one not that good but it's a bad
Hey, get out of there. I just, I just let him bury. Darn. Come on. Get out of there. Get out of there. Get out of there. Long and lean, and you've got some of that copper in your tail. Boy, how did you take that? Like that. Mm. All right. Adios. My second day on the water was a few days after uh, that, that snow bearing front. Uh, core water temperatures had dropped to 63 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the surface is still able to warm at this, at this calendar date though, um, and I watched it climb from 64 to uh, 72 over the course of the day. Forest fire smoke made for an eerie uh, dusky lighting, uh, despite the high pressure blue skies that I knew lay uh, above that that heavy smoke layer, uh, this likely uh, this 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 uh, almost overcast looking conditions likely depressed surface heating some. Uh, water clarity was uh, again at about three feet of visibility. No fish struck fast presentations. Uh, something I often like to start with, uh, especially in the fall, especially in, in, in cool in cooler and, and warmer water seasons, transition seasons. Uh, crankbait, lipless, buzzbait, spinnerbait, wake and crankbait, nada. So I switched up and started finessing fish from uh, the deeper outer weed edge pockets that I'd found on, on, on day one during my sonar explorations. Uh, I also had some excitement running a swim jig through uh, that large patch of dead milfoil slop that had, had grown up over the summer on a, a, a high spot surrounded by deep water. As the day warmed, I came upon a carnage zone area in the back end of the protected south basin, um, an area that was uh, both a down, down breeze uh, and had a calm surface that provided heating. Their aggressively feeding bass were found in 71 degree Fahrenheit water, um, up from 64 that morning, a 7 degree uh, Fahrenheit change. Um, you know, a heat gain like that um, and, and prey <laughs> uh, and bass makes for a pretty good recipe for a carnage zone. Well worth looking for. The main story though, and the majority of my fish, came along the shoreline of the main basin. From stomach sampling, crayfish appeared to be a major prey focus, which got me looking for fishable crayfish habitat. Uh, the most obvious place was a long riprap line shoreline. Uh, but along that 300 yard shoreline, I only caught mature bass where there were um, either stands of, of hard stemmed rush, um, there wasn't a lot of it, or beneath or out from prominent shoreline trees. Prominent shoreline trees are worth talking about. Um, even single lone trees can attract bass as safe hunting and resting spots. Here's just such a mature bass in its hold, or, or, or lie, using the trout fisher's term, beneath a single prominent tree. It spends considerable time here, sleeping, but with one eye, or, or I suppose one brain hemisphere, open for prey or danger. If you've ever wondered if fish sleep, uh, they do, and this one is sleeping. This spot's this lie is only in about 18 inches of water, okay? But the security provided by that tree above and some light brush in, uh, uh, there is enough for this bass to get some rest. Although trees that are overhung create canopy that bass really like. 
Trees do not need to overhang the water to attract bass. And believe it or not, they don't even need to throw shade. Just their presence can be enough. I believe that it's the fear of predatory birds that uh, is the main reason why overhead cover is so important to bass. These promising shallow shoreline spots where I targeted crayfish hunters were a challenge to fish well. They were less than three feet deep with good water clarity and a calm surface, which meant that it would be easy to spook those fish in just in trying to get a lure to them. Things that can alarm such shallow fish in good visibility conditions are the lure flying through the air, uh, the lure landing, uh, a length of line landing, uh, or, or the line moving uh, on, uh, on the flat surface, and the lure or line abruptly disturbing coarse vegetation, like, like branches, um, either in or above the water. Any of these things can send a super shallow bass bolting for the depths. If you're fishing sloppy, you may not even have known those bass were there. So to cover that shallow calm water, I went to a 1 8 ounce jigging trailer and I presented it in this way. I tried for a silent splashdown on every cast uh, by working close uh, and trapping the line uh, on the cast. That is, stopping the lure just before it splashed down. getting it to like come to a, a just to a stop just over the water where it can fall inside uh, quietly and then engage the lure immediately for strike detection at both splashdown and during the initial fall to prime times to get struck after the jig settles i pause and that's to give bass attracted to or curious about the splashdown time to get there I then gather up my line and just twitch the jig, uh, just twitch it uh, for that first subtle trigger to let arriving bass find the lure and know that it's indeed alive. I then start a retrieve. Uh, now one could just reel it back in uh, for another cast, but uh, in this case there were bluegill hunters about too, further out on the shelf. So my craw jig then became a swim jig. Uh, and and the, the triggers I used were uh, uh, being accelerations. Get on him. That's a fish. There's one. Same spot. Whoa. Jump. Here we go. All right, one last. Come on, boy. Whew. Another 15er. They're doing well in here. They're doing okay. You were caught and torn. Somebody got you with a... Hmm. You're not going to open up down there, are you? There we go. All right, all right, we'll let you go. We'll let you go. Rods everywhere.
lot of cover, but there is a hole here, so let's see if I can actually finesse somebody out of this hole. It's clean. Got one. I hit a clump and he chased it up. Not a big fish, but it's a feisty one. That's awesome. I'll take him. Whoa. Fighting like a walleye. <laughs> Diving for the bottom, but I ain't gonna let you. Lucky you're not big enough to get to the bottom. Oh, he just regurgitated something. Darn it! Not gonna be able to see it. He just spat up a fish. Come on! Come on! And there's fish holding underneath me. Let's get this up so you don't catch one of those underneath you. All right. Another 15er. You've got food in you. You've got fat and food. Let me see what it is. Bluegills, perch, shad. You got food packed in your stomach. I don't think I'm gonna be able to get any out though. I saw you regurgitate some. All right, there's a crayfish. There's crayfish parts in there. Not sure if you can see that. You're a pretty thing. You are. Here you go. All right, that's that. I guess it's not surprising that I... Okay, there's stuff happening right here. So I just caught a 17er. I have no idea if it was on the camera. It appears it wasn't on the main camera. I'm hoping the hat camp caught it. <sighs> Otherwise, <laughs> I'll have to catch some more. <sighs> Got him. <laughs> Did you see this? <laughs> he was looking. Holy moly. <laughs> smaller fish, but I'll take them. Hey, fella. All right, give me your mouth. Give me your head. You're a feisty thing. Gotcha. All right, another dark water bass. Looks like the other one, but two inches shorter. Wow. Wow, I'll bundle up here. <laughs> Look at that. Plastic curled back on itself and rehooked the plastic. There we go. Wow, we really inhaled that. Got double hooked. There we go. Man. All right. Another 
dark water bass. There you go, fella. He just chased a bluegill up. A little more tension there. We're gonna we're gonna work this area a little bit because there are bass hunting in here. And it's 70 degrees in here. Hope the camera's on this time. I can see you down there coming up. Here you come. Whoop, missed you. Try it again without jumping. Come on, come on, come on. Gotcha. All right. You also have been caught. <laughs> oh, man. And you coughed up something here. I'm going to give it back to you, but I want to see what's in there. There's a lot in there, actually. <laughs> okay. See what you are on, buddy. Shards. There is sorry, buddy, there's a some crayfish parts. And this is, oh my God, it's a freaking mouse. Look at that. This bass, this bass has eaten a mouse. See the tail and, and the feet? Oh my gosh, ears, look at that, whiskers. the skull see if I can arrange this so we can identify him look at that whiskers and everything I'm gonna give it back. You're gonna get it right back there, sweet pea. All the way down it goes. All right, mouse eater. And crayfish. There were Two crayfish pinchers, same crayfish, and uh, I saw the both pinchers and uh, antennae in there. Rinse this out.
Okay, good. All right, we're gonna try to slop fish these things first. Because <clears throat> it's so dense underneath, flipping isn't gonna help me. It's just gonna bury. There's one right in that stuff. Oh, come on out of there. And it is not a, not a big one. I was hoping for a big one. <laughs> Anybody following? He's in with that heavier stuff. Another carbon copy. Just about 15. Okay. There it is. Pretty pretty. Nothing in there. There you go. There you go, fella. Bluegill hunter. I just got chased up. That dude was looking for speed. I don't know if he's gonna go after it again, but. Got him. Oh, I gave him up. That was a good one. That was a better fish. I slacked up the tiniest bit. I think he wrapped around stuff on me. Boy, he was aggressive. Do you see that? It was a chase up. When I accelerated it, he came for it. That hurt. That hurt. I didn't have my camera on. Anyway, as I was saying, I'm expecting you're gonna jump again, aren't you? So, yeah, this one's on the thin side. Yeah, you got something in there. Nothing sticking out of the stomach there. So I was, what I did, well, let's get this fish unhooked first. Whoa, don't tear it. Come on, there. Got something. Yep, crayfish. I can see the parts in there. I don't think it's going to be anything salvageable here. All right. All right, crayfish eater.
Okay, hon. I'll give you that pincher back for what it's worth. There you go. Okay, some shards. So, I noticed this hard stem rush here, and um, it tends to grow in a firmer, like a grittier substrate. Uh, and I've got a lot of rock here, so there's obviously crayfish. But um, uh, other vegetation doesn't grow as well around hard stem. So, um, I, I cast right to the hard stem, right to the base of it, and plucked this fish. Uh, and I had my camera off. <laughs> nice shot right in there. There's one. Way under that tree. Did you see that? Perfectly silent cast. Splash down and... You were laying in there hunting, weren't you? That's right, no jumping, no jumping. <sighs> a little longer than, you know, there's I guess probably a 16er. Little thumb of thin, they're all on the thin side though. It's all the vegetation that they have to deal with in the summer. And look, his tail's worn, do you see that? that uh, curve to the tail, the warp on the lower dorsal, that's from lying on the bottom or holding in a position. And it could be that that's a favorite holding spot and contact with the bottom is what causes that. There we go. Okay. Yeah, I got a camera on. What do you know? I'm just going to call you a crayfish hunter and there doesn't look like much in you right now. There we go. Oh, that one needed, needed a perfect cast. There's an overhang tree over red cover. There's a little runway there. And there's a crayfish burrow in it. And then there's a little divot, a freshly dug divot, that probably where that fish's tail was holding and clearing away surface sediments. And then when she saw the lure, you know, it landed perfectly, quietly, um, came into view, she bolted for it, and it probably cleared away a little more sediment. That's my guess. Oh, did you see that? Let's go right over there. Let's go right over there. We can come back to there. That was a big fish. All right. Throw over the top of them. That was not a crayfish chase. That was a... There. Oh, I got sucked. Might have been a small fish, but I felt that right through. I got some hunters here. That was a, a bait fish chase. Now whether it's a big bass chasing smaller bass. Get on him. That's a fish. Oh, yes. Okay, come on in. These are all the same age. These fish are all the same age. Small mouth though, that's a good sign. Small mouth on you. 
All right, not seeing anything in there. No antennae sticking out. nothing but there's something in there all right hon that was the right cast yeah it's just rock in there anybody holding in there Oh, I got one. I got nailed coming out. Oh, I lost her. Gosh darn it. I think I had a little too much pressure um, for the, uh, the distance, the amount of line out. Um, usually with a jig, you've got to keep pressure, but this is a zero degree head with a short shank. Has a tendency to give fish away if um, uh, they pull out and I let her go. I was a little overzealous in that. No weeds down at eight feet. No wonder I was running clean there. There's one. Oh, it came off again. All right, let's check this hook, man. That's two in a row. What's going on with my hook? It's sharp. I think it's the same deal. I think I'm playing them too hard. That's a fish. Boy, he ran out of there quick. Well, that's not over, over hit him. Just keep a bend in the rod, Paul. A little better fish under that tree. Boy, this stuff is predictable. That was fun. There's a tree branch you managed to run around. And you've been caught before. There's a better fish. There's a this one probably just 17. And a little bit of bottom of bottom of the fin tail wear. Mm. Barely hooked. And about the same body condition on the thin side. I'll let you go in a moment there, hon. Yes, you've been caught. Somebody, nice hook, hook release job there. A little red in the mouth coming. Good length for the body, for the mouth size. And this is not a totally young fish because of the warped fins here, I think, and rounded fins. Do you see how rounded the fins are not sharp edged? Okay, hon. There you go. There's one. Oh. Skinny thing, I think. Oh, there's another one in there. Oh. It's 
the zero degree. It's not the same fish, that's all I gotta say. <laughs> it's gonna be about the same size, it seems like. Okay, let's hold on to this fish. They like that overhanging tree there. I don't think it's the same fish, or it's got different coloration anyway. size fish anyway. Come here. Oh man, it is the same size fish. But no mar no rubs on the tail. Uh, little lobe there. So this is not the same fish. I'm glad of that. Same size. And there's crayfish pinchers, crayfish pinchers inside there. I don't know if you can see it. Yep, crayfish eater again. And you got a hook mark there. And, and a hook mark in there, potentially. Maybe not. All right, honey bear. There you go.